Well, the purpose of the heavenly bodies are given twice. In verse uh, 14 and 18, it's to separate light from dark. In verses 14 and 18, also signs of the seasons, and then to give light in verses 15 and 17. But let me show you this in, the, in, in, in this pattern. This is called a chiasm, where on the left you have what God said earlier, to separate, to be signs, and to give light. And then in verses 17 and 18, he does it in reverse order, to give light and as signs and to separate. So it makes an X or the Greek letter chi or chi, which is why we call it a chiasm. Um, uh, you would all, if you were taking a, a literature class, you might call this an ABCCBA pattern. Um, but it's a satisfying, a very satisfying way of, of describing things. I catch myself doing this when I'm preaching sometimes. Um, it's an easy way to remember a list and to give yourself variety is to do A, B, C, C, B, A. You know, it's just a memory trick as you're, as you're, as you're doing. Um, also, when I'm doing lists in preaching, I like them to be in threes if possible because there's something about saying three things that's far more satisfying than a pair or four. Three is, it sounds right, it's enough. It's, if I say more, I'm overdoing it. If I do only two, have I made my point? Something, something about three is just... Well, Trinity. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's related to Trinity, but it seems to be, and it's just satisfying for our way of hearing. So some points that he makes. Have you got this if you're, if you're copying down? Well, it, look at what it's, at what it's pointing to. So separate on the, on the left is at the top, yeah. and on the right is at the bottom. So it's just drawing a line, in, it's just showing you the A, B, C, C, B, A. The, to... Oh, the Greek letter yeah. chi, C-H-I is how you spell that. C-H-I. Yeah. So if you're doing your Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, yoda, kappa, lambda, mini, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, epsilon, phi, chi, psi, omega. Third to last letter of the Greek alphabet is the X letter. Oh, yeah. And then they, they, when, they, when they noticed this, they, uh, they used it to... To, to point out grammarian, ancient grammarians. And so they, they called it a chiasmus, a, um, which really just means um, it, it's got that chi or key structure. That's what that means. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is this a pretty popular writing style in Hebrew? And Greek. And Greek too? Oh, wow, and Greek, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's so popular that I had a teacher, uh, he's one of the professors at MLC now. I had him back at Northwestern um, where I had, uh, uh, I, anyway, um, he was working on his, I think, a, a second master's or a doctorate where he was taking extra classes probably at Northwestern in Chicago, which is a good place to get a, another master or a, a doctorate if you're going to do a Greek doctorate. A term, it's called getting your terminal degree if you're if you're going to be teaching, and he and he uh, he said I don't have a pen with me, but he was his the prof was playing with a pen. I think I have one down here, and um, and uh, and he was giving a presentation in the class, and the prof's kind of you know juggling, and it's kind of bored, you know one more paper from graduate students, and what are we doing? And and the and the guy was doing a chapter of I'll say New Testament or whatever it was, and he begins. The, 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 the presentation by saying, you know, this whole chapter is a gigantic chiasm. And the prof threw his pen up in the air and said, what isn't in the Bible? He just, because everything, it's like, this is not a new thing. Because everything is, is like a chiasm in the Bible. So very many things are like that. In fact, uh, amazingly, the two genealogies of Jesus, one in Matthew and one in Luke, are a chiasm because they're flipped. Because oh, yeah. because one starts with Adam and one's and one or one starts with Abraham and goes to Christ and one starts at Christ and goes all the way back to Adam because they do them in reverse <coughs> in reverse order. So there's all you, there's all kinds of them. One I oh, don't mind me doing this. One author who breaks the cycle, who doesn't do chiasms, but he does 
threes, uh, I call them triads, is Jude. That little bitty book before Revelation, um, Jude loves to group everything in threes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You can even, you can circle them or whatever. And then sometimes, though, you'll say, uh-uh, oh, hey, pastor, that was a pair. But then look, because it's not just a pair, it's three pairs. It's another three. And sometimes it's a super triad. It's three threes. And then he goes back to threes and threes and threes. And, they, and so that it's a, it's a fascinating little book of, of examples, you know, and you know, what, what are the warnings he's given? And it's a beautiful document because the poor guy, he says in the opening verses, I wanted to write about the great salvation that we share. Basically, what he just said was, I wanted to write Romans, but you dummies, I had to write this instead to warn them. So be, what, the impression I get when, when, when Jude is writing his letter is that the He's, he's, he, I believe he's writing to the Christians of Asia Minor where Peter had written. And Peter had written two letters to those, to those folks while Paul was off in Spain. And Peter, they, there was a problem and Peter had to write to them. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 2, the apostle gives all kinds of dangers. Watch out for this. False teachers are approaching and so forth. And then what does Jude do when he writes? I think he's writing to the same people. Because he takes, it's like he tore chapter 2 out of Second Peter and he changes all the verbs from future tense to present tense. So, but then he, he modifies it with his style though and he makes everything threes. So Peter gave some examples, but Jude gives all these carefully crafted triple examples. But I, you get the feeling that maybe the guy who was taking the letter was tapping his foot on the dock because Jude has to get this written right now quick while they're loading the hay bales because the guy, it's not like they had the U.S. mail They've, he's, or, or email. He's got to get the letter into the guy's hands to go to Asia Minor and that, or to Pontus or wherever, and that's what Jude is doing. So he's a little frustrated. You know, I wanted to write more about salvation, but I, because of these dangers, I have to write. So he basically copies Second Peter 2 and makes it all present tense. The false teachers have come among you and so forth. Fascinating little book. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you oh. think, quick, real quick, do you think Martin yeah. Luther used his style because like when you're studying the explanations <clears throat> of the commandments and things, for kids to learn, there's a lot of um, the same letter. Luther, I don't know if the alliteration is there in the yeah, German or because Luther wrote some of the catechism in Latin also. Okay. But Luther was a master at teaching. Do you know what Luther invented? Kindergarten. Besides the idea of the Christmas tree and the way we score bowling, all of those things are by Martin Luther. It has a German name, kindergarten. Yeah, kindergarten. Yeah, it's yeah. a place where you put your kinder. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what, and Luther came up with the idea, we should have kindergartens so that they're prepared when they get to school. They've already learned how to behave. It was kind of that <laughs> idea. Maybe. <laughs> you know, well, it, ki kids who have been in kindergarten have a better chance than kids who just begin in the first grade. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's gather them together. But Luther was an advocate for teaching our little ones because in, in some of the trades, they never, got a, they never left kindergarten. They couldn't afford any more school. In those days, your teachers... This lasted all, all the way out to the Napoleonic Wars where the teachers were paid according to what the students were learning. So you would have the, the one-room classroom and the school marm who would be teaching these kids um, their letters, how to read. The next level up would be the writers. They're learning how to write as well as read. And then the next level up would be the counters. You didn't teach anyone to count or to do math until they had learned to read and write, which also makes sense. But they were the one, she got paid the most for counters. So it was in the teacher's best interest to get the kids moving along because she got paid more the smarter the kids were and the more that they were learning. Yeah, I know, I know a story of one teacher who was compassionate to a family who was impoverished. 
and they were paying her uh, for one little girl to to learn her her letters to read and she was teaching her already how to how to do math and uh, the supervisor almost fired her over that you know you don't do that you've got to get paid and she was just being a nice person but anyway all right so uh, the the point we've had for with 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 day four, the Earth existed before everything else. Earth is not an accident of the universe; it's the point of the whole universe. The sun serves the Earth. We're not an accident of the of our of our of our sun, and the existence of the sun, moon, and stars depend on the Earth. Earth is the location of the crown of God's creation. When those of us on the earth are taken away on Judgment Day, everything else rolls up like, like mom yanking on a window shade and brrr, rattle, 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 you know, it just, it goes. It's done with. My mother taught a special needs boy in the church kitchen. Um, all of his Sunday school, all from, 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 we, from kindergarten to eighth grade until he was confirmed. The same boy on a stool in the kitchen every Sunday with a felt board. This is back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, when I, I remember my mother um, doing this when, she would, when they would talk about the end of the world. He, he, he thought it was funny because she would yank on one of the kitchen curtains and make it rattle, you know, roll up, you know, like that. And it's kind of a fun thing. Yeah. Mom, mom passed away the year after he was confirmed. So that uh, part of her life's work was to carry that little boy, his name was Ricky, to take him all the way through his Sunday school and catechism. She worked with another woman, but um, they, they, they brought him, the team taught him, um, and was a, an amazing work. I, Mom must have medals on her chest in heaven because of what she did there. A special glory, you know, yeah. All right. Um, Jesus says... Immediately after the distress of those, these are the last days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the skies, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So a reminder from Jesus of what's in store for all of this stuff in the end. So heavenly bodies is like everything? Or? Yeah, the, the planets and stars especially, okay. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in 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 that sense, the outer space where the isn't a thing to be shaken in my mind because it's just a void. Mm -hmm. But everything in it is shaking, and there could be waves of, you know, that that's how things work is is waves of energy moving outward, and and if God is going to blast everything to you know to make room for the new heaven and new earth, then He's going to shake everything in it. But yeah, you'll give it all a shake. Like a forest when the gale comes, everything is going, right? Everything is shaking. It's scary to be in a woods when that happens. Yeah, or on a ship tossed at sea. Yeah, all right. So the earth existed first. The sun serves the earth. I said this, and the sun, moon, and stars will disappear when the earth has run its course. Um, so there's sun and moon together. Um, I don't know who took that picture of, of a partial eclipse there. I've tried several times. I never had a good enough camera to do anything, but I sat up late at night, you know, doing that. This is one of my favorite pictures of the stars because it's from the opening screen of the TV show Star Trek. So it's, they're not even, it's not even real. It's just, uh, <laughs> but you were testing that. Gives me gives me great pleasure. This is an actual photograph of Saturn from one of the Voyager spacecraft. Um, gorgeous yellow world with many many rings, and that those spacecraft learned that some of the the rings have little divisions in them, and they have little moons that keep those divisions clear, and they call them shepherd moons. So they they kind of keep their sheep in place. It's kind of really really cool. Um, I don't know if any of you know the, the group Clanid or Moira, Moira's, uh, the, the lead singer of Clanid, her little sister's name is Enya. Did a bunch of really cool songs back in the 80s. Um, Orinoco Flow and things like that. That's Enya. 
Um, uh, she also did, a, a, I think, an album called Shepherd Moons, mm -hmm. uh, which mentions yeah. this. I was going to yeah. say, I've heard it before. Yeah, that's where, it, that's where it's from. Okay. So, okay. so you know your Irish Celtic music. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Sure, <laughs> yep. And, and before Enya, I was a fan of her older sister and uncles who made Clanid, this other group that they all kind of joined together with. Anyway, back to, I would, back to Isaiah 45. It is I who made the earth and created mankind upon it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. The word marshaled there is what you do with an army. You, uh, you command it to go where it's supposed to go. The marshal is the one. A marshal outranks even a general or an admiral. He's, the, he's I mean, who, um, uh, you know, Napoleon's marshals in France outranked everybody. It was a new name. And, but a marshal is the one who is above even the, the map and says, this army with its general goes here, and this army with its general goes here. That's what God does with the stars. He just tells them all where to go. And in Job, he whistles for them to come home at night like cows. You know, time to come in. <laughs> that Job is a, a spectacularly beautiful book. Um, I've, I've worked through it as a teacher a couple of times, wrote a commentary about it, and I'd like to do more. Because it's just such a gorgeous document. So much lovely stuff to be learned and scary stuff to be learned in the book of Job. <clears throat> All right. Anything left on day four? Shall we allow the sun to come up on day five? And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. We don't use the word team very often, but it's kind of the, like the same word for swarm. Let it, let it team. Let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. I wish I had a, a little video of what uh, uh, blackbirds do sometimes. They, blackbirds swarm in the sky the way that schools of fish swarm in the, in the water. I've seen it happen in person and I've seen one or two videos, but it's amazing where this cloud of Birds, sometimes bats do it too, but just when to, to see bla the blackbirds do it is just amazing, just glorious. Let the bird, and of course, what bird famously did it above the United States so that it blocked out the sun? They're extinct now. The passenger pigeon. The two things that ancient cowboy movies are missing is because they can't is they never show passenger pigeons, and the, the sky should be full of passenger pigeons still, and they never show the three years of the locust plagues, 1874 to 1877, when there were locusts everywhere from, from Missouri to Montana, including Minnesota. Laura Ingalls Wilder mentions it in one of her, I think it's on the banks of Plum Creek, one of the books she talks about it, but it, they were there for three years and would eat the suspenders off a farmer as he stood there, um, eat the harness and the tack off the horses, consumed all the field. Little boys would get rich um, carting uh, penny loads, a penny of, uh, for, a, for a, a, a bushel basket or a, or a, or a, um, a wheelbarrow to burn, to take them to the burning. And half of them were still alive. They didn't care, just to burn them. And boys were making dollars doing penny loads of locusts to burn. Yeah, yeah. But the, the old westerns don't show them or the passenger pigeons. So now today with CGI and all that, maybe, maybe they can remake all those old westerns with locusts everywhere and gross stuff like that. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know if the James Younger gang was around during the locust years. It'd be kind of interesting to, they were kind of local. Jesse James was around here and so forth. But, all right. All right. So why were the fish and birds created together on the same day? Well, the, a question that the ancient theologians asked were, does it concern the material they were created from 
or the place where they were created for? Why do them before dogs and cats? Why do fish and birds first? You know, why not do them on the same day? Um, I have an answer, but let's, <laughs> let's go through the ancients first. So, tempus non fugit, which means time is not fleeting. We have time to talk about this. Oh, there's a lot of Latin here. Well, why use English if Latin will do? Uh, so, materia ex qua, that means the materia, material from which. Is it about what they were made out of? So, was everything made out of water? Ex aqua? Luther, Abraham Kalov, Martin Chemnitz, they thought that maybe. These are all ancient Lutheran guys, by the way. They're all Orthodox Lutherans. I don't read or quote anybody else. So just, just the old Lutherans. And then, or ex terra, is it from the earth? And Bayer, who was especially loved by a Lutheran named Walther. Um, Walther really, really loved Bayer. And, uh, or David Hollitz, who was not a theologian uh, professor. He was an ordinary pastor. I have a special place in my heart for David Hollitz because I'm also just an ordinary pastor and not a... Not a, not a wise professor. You know, I'm just a regular old pastor like David Hollitz. I, although, unlike Hollitz, I don't wear a ruff, a, a frill around my neck like that. Would, would you like me to see that, in the, see that in the pulpit, John, sometime if I have stepped up David Hollitz's birthday and I could wear, wear the frill? But, um, yeah. So that, they, they kind of wondered about that. Well, uh, I'm going to come. I'm going to read one more verse, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's being made here. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Um, so all of the all you know, every living thing with which the water teems is not just fish with scales. We're talking about here. Um, eels and sharks and all of all of that stuff and all the gross things that eat what we don't want to think about, like which is the the shrimp and the and the things like that. So Linnaeus in 1735 began to classify according to plants and animals, and the five main kingdoms for Linnaeus were bacteria, protozoa, primitive creatures, plants, fungi and animals. But keep in mind that Moses comes before Linnaeus. Moses, Moses doesn't care about Linnaeus. Um, and so we're not going to classify um, animals according to is it primitive creature or is it an animal or whatever it is. But Linna to continue with Linnaeus, sea creatures, he would carve it down to, first of all, invertebrates, that is no backbone, crabs, urchins and starfish, barnacles, worms, jellyfish, coral, oysters, clams, snails, slugs, squid, octopi. No backbone. Okay? And then vertebrates. Hagfish, which are slimy snake worms. They're their own category. Lampreys, like eels and things. And then bony fish, like rays. And lobe-finned fish, like coelacanths and lungfish and oarfish. And cartilaginous fish, sharks and rays, and saltwater mammals like whales and dolphins. Okay? And if you want to do it even bigger, you've got phyla, subphyla, class, class, and, um, and uh, order and kingdom and so forth, right? So uh, that's according to. This is still Linnaeus, and where did we put things? Okay. With, for example, with Linnaeus also with birds, and we're running short on time. I'm going to go right to birds here. So you've got chickens, geese, and ducks are one category. Hummingbirds, their own thing. Pigeons, grouse, cuckoos, and then songbirds, very close. Waders and water birds, closely related. Hawks, owls, and others. But what else are flying creatures besides these? All of these. Flies, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, ladybugs, bees and hornets, grasshoppers, mayflies or lacewings, and others. 
All of them are flyers. To the, are they all day five animals? I kind of think that they are. You know, and all those aquatic worms and gross things, I think that those are day five things too. They're just in the, in, down in the drink. You know, um, St. Augustine says what's mad, what matters is that God said, God created, and then God saw. What Moses did is Moses, and I think I'm going to say, state this and we'll pause here. And I, I, I don't have a slide for this in this spot, but I should say it at the end of the class today is that for Moses, the animals are only in five categories. The birds or the flyers, the fish or the swimmers, and then the animals, which we haven't talked about yet, which are, number one, wild animals. That's lions and tigers and bears. Domestic animals, cows and fish and things like that, and crawling things. And they're on, they're, they're on, they're separate categories but that those are the categories of land animals along with fish and birds those are the only five categories Moses gives and we're going to pay attention to that especially in the story of the fall because at the beginning of chapter three the serpent is called a wild animal and before 20 verses have gone by God changes the classification of the serpent to a crawling thing God changes the status of the snake. And we sometimes worry about, did it have legs or whatever? That's not the point the Bible makes. God changes the, the serpent's status from wild animal to crawling thing, just as God changed the status of Adam and Eve from in God's image to now sinful. Well, they changed their own status by sinning. Okay. Okay. Uh, um not to put it this way, but that's a whole nother can of worms. And uh, we'll, we'll continue there then, though, at the beginning of day six, then next time. Until then, God bless you. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.